All right, let's go ahead and take our song sheets and stand. And we're going to start with At Calvary, Years I Spent in Vanity and Pride. And we'll sing all four of these stanzas. Here we go. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word, by God's word, at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned, till my guilty soul in glory turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden soul found liberty at Calvary. of thinking about and singing about and having the con the uh, topic of Calvary brought up. Oh, here we go again. Talking about the cross and the blood and the reason that we have eternal life every moment of our lives. So hope that we are enjo enjoying our salvation and love singing about it. Let's sing about the love of God. We'll sing uh, all three of these verses together. On the first together. The love of God is greater far than time or pain. Can ever tell it goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. My guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his erring child, he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless. And strong, it shall forevermore endure. The saints and angels, when years, when years of time shall pass away, and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who here refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains fall, God's thoughts so sure shall still endure, all measureless. And strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels song. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure, the saints and angels song. On the last, when we let be the ocean fill. And were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a stripe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, go stretch from sky to sky. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure! How measureless and strong It shall forevermore endure The saints and angels song All right, wonderful uh, 
truth, the love of God more than we can ever comprehend. Uh, how many thought that was a little bit high there, the singing? All right. Well, you say, well, why is it so high? Anybody still asleep? We're all awake. So that's, that's uh, did it accomplish its purpose. Let's sing one more song on the back side. Be ye steadfast. This is from 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast, unmovable. We'll sing it all together a couple of times. for all of us. It's easy to uh, always look for, sometimes people live for the weekends and they live for themselves. Uh, God says he wants us to always be abounding in the work of the Lord. I think about the example of Jesus. Uh, his, the disciples were probably many times saying, Jesus, can we just take a break? And he was like a whirlwind. He was just going and going and going. When it was time to take a break, he would find someone else to minister to and heal. And he was always abounding and, of course, he was the Lord. He was always abounding in serving others, and he calls us to do the same thing. All right, good singing. You may be seated, and at this time, the choir is going to come and sing for us. Oh, 
blessing for him to meet with us. We already know, we already have a promise that where two or three are gathered together in his name, he is with us in our midst. But we'll pray that, that he meets with us in a special way that we perceive his hand, that we hear his voice, and that we follow it. So let's bow together and pray. Lord, thank you for holding our hands all throughout our lifetime. Thank you that whenever we are unfaithful, and in every day we struggle with unfaithfulness, but thank you that you are ever faithful. You'll never let us go we are secure in you, and help us to rejoice in that. Fill our hearts with gratitude, and I pray that as we hear your word, that we would hear you, your Holy Spirit, would speak to us individually, and we would say yes. Before we even know what it is, we would vow that we will follow you, whatever you have for us, and bless our time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Whenever people speak their last words, by the way, sometimes people don't know that their last words are their last words. You've ever seen, I'm going to read in just a minute, some uh, people collected some of the famous last words of people. Sometimes people say their last words not knowing that they are their last words. They, oh, if I, if I knew they were my last words, I would have made them better. I would have thought of something witty to say. Uh, but often when people, their last words, they're speaking to their loved ones, a child maybe, and when people utter their last words, you often see what is important to them. They often don't care about, who, who cares about sports? Who cares about, what the, oh, so what's the weather like? It doesn't matter so many of the trivial things that we often talk about. The, if you had the, the last thing that you could ever say to someone, it often is going to bear out what is really important to you, at least. Uh, listen to some of these. A man named Donald O'Connor. O'Connor was a singer, a dancer, and an actor known for his role in Singing in the Rain. He also hosted the Academy Awards in 1954. He died at the age of 78 with his family gathered around him, and he joked, I'd like to thank the Academy for my Lifetime Achievement Award that I will eventually get. Uh, and he still hasn't gotten one, by the way. But that was what was important to him at the end of his life. You know, I just wish I could have gotten the Academy Award. Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, famous scientist and Christian, when he died, he, he was humble, and he said, I don't know what I may seem to the world, but as to myself, I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself now and then in finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than the ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. So he discovered a lot of things, and he gets to the end of his life, he realized, I don't know anything. I was just playing on the shore, and there was a whole ocean that's yet to be discovered. He's a very humble man. Leonardo da Vinci. This is not one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Leonardo. This is different. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci, the, uh, the artist. Uh, he was also modest at, at his death, and he said, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Interesting. He, he looks back on his life and he says, I, I could have done better uh, in you know, my art and so forth. Uh, and then there's someone like James Rogers. He was a murderer. He was on death row. He was put in front of a firing squad in Utah, and he was asked, do you have a last request? And he said, I would like a bulletproof vest. <laughs> I mean, he didn't give him that. So anyway, people have different things on their minds as they, as they end their lives. 2 Samuel 23 shows, it, it calls it, the last words of David. That's what we were going to title our message today, the last words of David. We see it right there in 2 Samuel 23 in verse 1. It says, now these be the last words of David. And they may not have literally been the last words that he uttered as he died. Who, who knows, they may have been. But I think what it's pointing to is that they were the last words that were inspired they were the last words that were in the, this is kind of a psalm, verses 1 through 7 that we'll see. They were the last words, by the way, they are, they are a psalm or a psalm. They don't appear in the book of Psalms, but they are nonetheless inspired. And maybe we could say that these were his last poetic, his last official words. Uh, but, but it shows, as he gets to the end of his life, 
what was important to him, and more importantly, as we see, and, and by the way, we know that everything in the Bible is inspired, we'll just get there in just a moment, but he says uh, at the beginning of this that what he is about to say is directly inspired by God. He says, these are the words of God. So the, the last words of David are the words of God that shows us what God thought was important for David to say and to think at the end of his life. So I want to look at several uh, thoughts as we were going to look at verses, verses 1 through 7 this morning. Uh, and first of all, I want to see David's self-description here in verse 1. So it says, now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, and then he goes on to say, but he kind of introduces himself and he gives a description, a fourfold description of himself. Uh, and basically it starts with a statement of his humility. And yet, despite that, the exaltation that God gave him that he had no deserving of. He says, David, the son of Jesse. Who's the son of Jesse? Who is Jesse? I think the point here is that Jesse was really a nobody. Uh, he was, David was not born into great wealth. Now he had, uh, his father had, you know, some means. He had a handful of children, several children. He had flocks and herds and so forth. But he was not among the wealthiest people in all of Israel or the most powerful people. Uh, he was in the tribe of Judah. And the Bible says that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. So you could say that he was royal blood, but the royal blood started with him. He was the very first one of the kings of Judah. And uh, so there was nothing in his past he could point to and say, look who I am. Do you know who my father is? He says, I'm just a son of Jesse. And yet, the son of Jesse and the man who was raised up on high. He didn't start on high. Being the son of Jesse didn't mean that he was on high. But God reached way down, even though he was just an unknown shepherd boy. And, and he raised him up on high and promoted him, exalted him, gave him a great place of authority among, among his people, among God's people. So it says, the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. Uh, hold your finger here. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 8. God reminds David, this is when David has sinned with Bathsheba, and God comes to him and reminds him where he came from. As if to say, who do you think you are to just do whatever you want to do and go out and take Bathsheba and kill Uriah? Uh, who do you think you are? I, I know where you came from because I found you. So look what he says, 2 Samuel 7 and verse 8. It says, now therefore, so shalt thou say, this is God speaking to Nathan, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. What an amazing turn of events. Who would we have picked to be the next king? They, first of all, they had King Saul. He was tall, dark, and handsome, whatever. He was good looking. You look at him, you thought, oh, that guy should be a king. David was the furthest thing from that. You'd look at him, you'd say, wow, he'd make a good shepherd. Oh, he's a shepherd. You know? he, he was just following the sheep. Notice, it didn't even say that the sheep were following him. It says he was following the sheep. His, his job was to just go chase after these dumb animals that would fall off cliffs and stuff, and that was his responsibility in life. But God said, I reached down, I saw his heart. And it's not that just that God rewarded him because of his heart. God just blessed him with grace. He didn't deserve what he was given to be ruler over my people, over Israel. Look at Revelation chapter 1 very quickly in verses 5 and 6. This is the perspective that all of us should have as Christians, that we're kind of like David. We're just nobodies, but God has reached down and lifted us up and given us things that we have no business having, promises of God, eternal promises. So look at Revelation 1 verse 5. The first part of the verse says, And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. And it says this, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood 
and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. On a broad scale, what we could say about David's beginning is the same with us. God just, he was walking around and he just sees us down in the ditch, face down in the gutter spiritually, so to speak. And he says, and he forgave us of our sins. And he just didn't say, oh, you're forg- okay, you're forgiven. You know, you can go. He brings us in and says, and he's made us kings and priests unto God. And this is something that we will do in the future, but it's already who we are now. We are kings right now, we or queens. We are priests of God. What does a king do? He reigns. The Bible says that we're going to rule and reign alongside of Jesus for the millennial kingdom and then throughout all of eternity. We're going to reign with him forever. We don't deserve to be there. It says also we are priests. What's something that a priest does? A priest is somebody who gets to go directly to God. And on the behalf of someone else, we can we can see someone with a need, and we can go to God on their behalf. We don't have to go to a priest. We don't have to confess our sins to a priest. We get to go directly to the throne of God. An amazing access that was granted to us, and we we didn't earn that. We never could have earned that in a million lifetimes. Uh, and so, if but if we ever think, oh look who I am, I'm exalted. Just remember who brought us there, where we came from, and we don't deserve anything uh, that could be said about us. How would you describe yourself? You know, if someone would say, hey, maybe you're, anyone ever gone on one of these dating sites? Um, husbands and wives, don't raise your hands. You ever been on one of these uh, dating sites? Uh, I hope as a married person you've never done this. But, you know, sometimes you go on, people go on these dating sites and they, and they enter a profile. Tell me about yourself. Oh, well, I'm, I'm tall or I'm outgoing or I'm smart and educated, or I'm socially awkward, whatever. People describe themselves. If you were to describe yourself, what would you say? Most people, they only think about the physical things. When they, when they answer the question, who are you? They say, well, who am I? I've, I've accomplished this. This is what I've done in business. These are my uh, educational, you know, what I've accomplished in education. They often think physical things. David said, as he gets to the end of his life, who am I? He says, I was just the son of Jesse, but God anointed me. He raised me up. He caused me to be the ruler over his people. And then he says, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. I, I'm the person, I, I just pinch myself. How did I get here? God chose me to be the one that could write his holy word and teach people how to worship God. What a wonderful privilege. That's who David saw himself as. Somebody who was greatly exalted even though he had no business being there. Even though he was uh, he, he was very humble, but God had blessed him. Uh, and so we see David's description of himself. Let's go on number two. Look at what he says in verse two. And here I want to see God's inspiration in what David is saying and writing here. It says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. We'll get to that end phrase in just a moment. But as he starts this, he says, I want you to know what I'm about to say is not my words. These are the words of God. And this is the truth of everything that you hold in your hand, in your lap, in God's word. It's often, people often say something like this. Well, the Bible contains the word of God. And that is a, the first time I ever heard someone uh, say the, the distinction here, it slipped by me. Uh, but what do you think about that statement? The Bible contains the word of God. No, it sounds kind of good. But the Bible does more than just contain the word of God somewhere in there. It's in there. You just got to know where to look. Um, we talked about this in men's Bible study a couple weeks ago that Thomas Jefferson compiled something that he called, I don't know if he called it this, but it's called the Jefferson Bible. And what he did was he pulled out and threw away everything in the Bible except the words in red in the Gospels. That's basically it. The miracles of Jesus left it out. The the law, the prophets, the New Testament uh, epistles of Paul, they're not included. Uh, The only thing that he thought was worthwhile in the Bible was the words of Jesus. Everything else uh, in the preface, he calls it diamonds in a dunghill. Everything else in the Bible is just a dunghill except the words of Jesus. That is totally incorrect. 
that's wrong, it's blasphemy to say so many things that God said and to throw them away. Um, everything in the Bible, and look at a verse here, that, and we could look at others, but uh, maybe the best scripture about this, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Greek word is theopneustos, for that word in, uh, given by inspiration of God, and it literally means God breathed. It means God said everything that we have in the Bible. Now, not everything in the Bible, let me give you an example of this. The book of Job is filled with Job and his friends going back and forth. And some of what Job's friends say is not correct. God recorded what they said. At the end of it, he said that they haven't spoken right by me. But there, you know, the Bible contains the words of Lucifer when he says, I will be like the Most High. Is that true? Will Lucifer be like the Most High? No. So everything in the Bible is inspired as in God recorded it. Uh, I will say that everything that is given as instructions from God's people, this is the words of God. But sometimes people can get tripped over it. You can't just find any word, any page on the Bible, and you can hear one of the enemies of God speaking, and whatever he says, that's what we should follow. But everything in God's word, not it's not just in there somewhere. All of God's word, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and God has not only given it to us perfectly, but he's preserved it for us today. We can know what God's word is. And that's a wonderful thing. I hope that uh, you spend more time reading God's word than you read anyone else's word. There's only one book in the whole world that God wrote. And if God can create the whole universe like that, lickety split, he spoke and the worlds came into existence, then God can give us one book that he can preserve from the corruptions of men. I believe he's done that in his word, in the Bible. And I hope that you take God's word, not just this little Psalm of David where it says, God speak with me. The whole Bible is, this is, thus saith the Lord. And it's a blueprint for life. It shows you how to follow God. It shows you how, to, how you can be saved, how you can have eternal life. The only book in the Bible. There are a lot of counterfeits out there. There are a lot of people who have claimed to have written a holy book. There's only one book that God himself wrote. And we have it. Praise the Lord. And it's not because we earned it. It's just God allowed, us, allowed it to come to us. Uh, but that's what David says, that what he's writing, he recognizes that it's inspired by God. These are the words of God. And so number three, let's go and look at the second part of verse three. I want to look at the accountability of authority. He says, he that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. These are the words of God. God says to David, he, whoever rules over men must be just or righteous and ruling in the fear of God. But this, this doesn't say, whoever rules over men that knows me, that's one of my children, it doesn't say that. It says, anyone in the world that rules over men. And who rules over men? There's a lot. We could say there's wives. There's, uh, okay. uh, you know, this could be governmental authority. This could be parental authority. This could be a boss. This could be a parent. There are lots of opportunities that people have authority over. And it says this, that every human authority in the world is under God, is subservient to God, and is accountable to God for how they rule, for how they take care of those, for how, if I can use the word, for how they serve those under their authorities. A lot of times people look at power as... Uh, an opportunity, they look at authority as an opportunity to express themselves and do whatever they want. Oh, I'm in charge. I can do whatever I want. No, this verse says that believers and unbelievers alike, nobody gets to do whatever they want in their authority. God has set up, even unbelievers, God has set up all authority. He has allowed them to have their authority, and they will answer to God for how they treat those under them, for how they, if I can use this word, for how they represent God to those under them. See, whenever you have authority, you are a little bit of a go-between. God has given authority to you to express it over those under your authority, and we are to be his representatives. We are to rule the way that God himself would rule them, Amen. which is a tall order, uh, but nonetheless, it's what God calls us to. Because of that, we should be careful about power grabbing, about aspiring 
to authority because of the accountability that comes with it. Look at a verse in James chapter 3, uh, James 3 verses 1 and 2. It's a warning. And by the way, part of being human is that you love power. We, nobody loves to be trampled on and to be you know, dominated by someone else. We would enjoy to have freedom and authority. But it says, be careful about aspiring to that because of this. James 3 verse 1. It says, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. In other words, we are all sinful. Here's our encouraging thought for today. You are wretched. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I'm not coming from a place of authority. I am wretched. When we look in the mirror, we know ourselves. We know our, our heart's tendencies to be abusive at times, to be selfish. And so because of that, it says, be not many masters. Now, God calls people to be authorities. God gives people authority. But don't just aspire to and say, oh, I wish I had more and more and more, because the more you have, the more you are accountable for. It says, we shall receive the greater condemnation. God holds, if I can put it this way, a little bit of a different standard. Those with authority, he holds them to a very high standard because we represent, we kind of wield his authority. Look at Luke chapter 12, uh, verses 47 and 48. Here's what Jesus, uh, in one of his teachings, uh, shows. Luke 12, verse 47. It says, And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. So the master gives his servants um, a request, a command. I want you to go out in my field, and I want you to, from 3 a.m. or from 6 a.m. till 3 p.m., whatever, I want you to go and, and uh, gather out. I want you to sort it this way. These are my commands to you. And they know it. They know what they're supposed to do, but they don't do it. They disobey. They are punished. But look at verse 48. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. He'll, he'll still be beaten, but he's beaten with few stripes. And here's the principle. Here's the reason. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. We all identify with this. If someone is an employer or a parent, and there's someone that they have trained and taught and equipped uh, they expect a certain thing out of them. But if it's somebody, it's their first day on the job. You ever had somebody, it's their first day on the job. Oh, sorry, I don't know. Uh, they're at McDonald's. You, well, you just push the button with the picture of the hamburger on it. Right? It's like, can't be that hard. But, uh, you know, it's, I'm still learning. But if somebody, it's just their first day and they don't do something right, there's an understanding. You know, bless his heart, he doesn't know yet. He, it's just his first day. But those that have been given more, there's more required of them. And there's a lot of directions we can go with that we've been given more. We've been given a lot monetarily. If you want to compare ourselves with people in other places in the world, like India, you know, people, time, there's places where people can work all day every day and they make like a dollar a week or something like this, or the equivalent, and they, they barely can scrounge enough together to go buy enough food for a meal for the rest of their day and, and they're gonna to have to split it up with the rest of their family and they're in abject poverty. And God has blessed us. What are we doing with the money that he's given us? We often think selfish thoughts. This is for me. Everything we have is from God. God has given us instruction. God has given us knowledge. There are a lot of people in the world who have never heard the name of Jesus one time. And sometimes, even in the United States, there are people that the only time they've ever heard his name is in a curse word. They've never heard the gospel. They don't know the truth of salvation. But we have been given that. What are we doing with what we've been given? And one of the things here that I think we could point to is authority. When God gives someone more authority, there's going to be more accountability for that person. It's often said that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So be careful about wanting more and more power, more authority. It comes from God. But if you mistreat that authority over someone else, then we will give account. We will 
answer to God for every time that we mistreat someone, every time that we abuse our authority. Um, let's go on. I want to talk about authority more in, in uh, number four, uh, back in 2 Samuel 23, is the primary attribute of authority. He says, He that ruleth among men must be just. And we could, we could uh, kind of fill in the blank there. What if that were a blank? What does our world say? He that ruleth over men must be fill in the blank. What, what do we look for in our elected officials? Well, we need someone who is educated. Can't have, can't have an ignoramus running the world, you know, running our nation, running our state and our cities. Uh, you, must, you must have financial acumen. You know, you, you need to know uh, how to uh, organize a business or something like that. You need to be able to handle an economy. If this is going to be a world economy, then we need to make sure that somebody knows numbers. We need someone with military strategy. We need someone who has a good foreign policy. There's so many things that the world looks for. You know what God says? I only have one requirement for a leader. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. That's it. Now, this doesn't mean that, that it's wrong to get an education and learn about so many other things. But God says, when I look for a leader that, that I will bless, I only look for one thing. I look for someone that will look to me and say, I want to do things God's way. I want to rule in the fear of God. That's it. And it's kind of, it, I call this the, the primary attribute of authority. It doesn't mean that the other attributes are, are not good. But if, if someone has every character quality, every leadership quality, but the fear of God, that's a fatal flaw that nobody can recover from. If you lack the blessing of God on, your, on our nation, on a family, as, as a father or a parent, as a business leader, if you, I've got it all, I've, I've got all my decks in a row, I, I read the book on how to succeed, but if there's not a, a fear of God and God's blessing is missing, it's a fatal flaw that you can't recover from. And God may allow someone that without a fear of God, he may allow there to be a time of outward prosperity, but eventually the wheels are going to come off. And God only, uh, eventually there's going to be destruction of all of that. The number one thing that we should strive for is I want to fear God. Psalm 33, don't turn here, but Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. God will bless a nation, or and you could expand this to, to a family, to a church, to a group of people, any group of people that say, we want God to be our Lord. We want to follow God. We want to fear him. That's all that God requires. And then you could be an, an ignoramus in every other area of life, but God will make up for it with his blessing. And when you see, we've done this in the past, where we uh, kind of read about the kings of Israel, uh, and it boils it down to this, that this king, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and God blessed him. This king, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he was judged, and God judged him and his nation. That's the only thing that God looks for. God doesn't, and again, I'm not trying to, to uh, put down other ways that people can grow, but God doesn't care how much you know. God doesn't care how educated you are if you don't care about him. But if you know him and you follow him, he will take care of all the rest. You take care of God's business, he will take care of your business. And that, that promise bears it up, itself out all the way through the Bible. There's nobody that rules like this, right? He that rules over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. Okay, so what we need to do, we need to find someone out there that does this all the time. Now, now by the way, David wasn't perfect. He's a good example here. David was maybe the best king that Israel had, but the best that Israel, the best that humanity has to offer is, is horrible. This ought to cause us to yearn for Jesus. There's a day coming that there's going to be, for the first time ever, a king that does this justly all the time, that rules uh, justly in the fear of God. Turn to Isaiah. I want to look at a couple of passages in the Old Testament that prophesy the coming of Jesus, his kingdom, what he's going to be like, what it's going to be like. Isaiah 11, and then we'll look at Jeremiah 23. May we allow all of our own failures, because have you ever kind of beat yourself up over failing in some area? Maybe as an authority, oh man, I blew that decision. I should have prayed about that. I should have been more gentle. I should have listened to all the facts before I made that decision. Have you ever, as a leader, said, man, I really blew it? 
when that happens, don't get discouraged. And when, you're, when we're surrounded by leaders that are wicked, don't be discouraged by that and say, oh, this is so awful. Things couldn't possibly get any worse. Cause that to make you yearn for Jesus. Can we, can we flip it around? Instead of, being by, instead of being discouraged by failure, can we just cause us to yearn even more? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So look what it says when Jesus will come. Isaiah 11 and verse 1. It says, And there shall come forth a shoot out of the stock of Jesse, and a branch out of his roots shall bear fruit. So by the way, David was the son of Jesse, but this is written after David. David already came, and David already blew it because he was a sinner. But it says there's, there's another one coming out of the root of Jesse. Uh, Jesus is the son of David and so forth. Uh, it says, And shall bear fruit, verse 2, And the spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Jehovah and his delight. By the way, I've always marveled at this. Jesus is Jehovah, and yet he will have the fear of Jehovah. He says, I and my father are one, and yet he also says, I come to do the will of my father. You know, I'm going to stop talking before I you know, trip over myself because I don't understand all the inner workings of the Trinity. But we believe it, and it's a necessary truth. So Jesus, when he comes, he is the Son of God. He's God himself, but he will come in the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Jehovah. And his delight, verse 3, his delight shall be in the fear of Jehovah. So those that he will delight in and bless will be those that fear Jehovah also. His delight shall be in the fear of Jehovah. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes neither decide after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked and righteousness shall be the girdle of his waist and faithfulness the girdle of his loins. I hope that you're looking forward. By the way, look at another one in Jeremiah 23. I hope that you're looking forward to this day that finally somebody's here that there's no corruption in his government. There, there's no selfishness. There's no pride. There's no ego. There's only righteousness. Amen. Jeremiah 23, verse 5, it says, Behold, the days come, saith Jehovah, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called Jehovah our righteousness. Notice there that Jesus is Jehovah. His name, he's not just coming in the fear of Jehovah, his name is Jehovah our righteousness. And, and I hope that we, every day, and I confess that I don't think this thought every day, but the way the Bible ends is even so come Lord Jesus how often do we think that thought Jesus I can't uh, every time you stub your toe every time you make a mistake every time you fail uh, utter that thought even so come Lord Jesus deliver me from all this deliver me from myself deliver me from this evil world from the corruptions of governments that's what's coming uh, and, and so God says this to David there is accountability for all of authority and for those that have authority the number one thing God's looking for is righteousness that he fears the Lord. Let's go on number five. Look at verse four. Second Samuel twenty-three and verse four. I want to look at blessing on righteous authority that God promises. This is again talking about a person that rules over men in justice in the fear of the Lord. It says, and he shall be as the light of the morning, when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. And this is a kind of a beautiful poetic picture of the blessing of God on both a leader and then the, on the people that he rules over. That if somebody does it God's way, that the way that God will treat him, it will be like a breath of fresh air. Like when you wake up in the morning and it's not yet 95 degrees, but it's still nice and fresh and there's dew and there's 
grass springing out of the earth like a clear shining after rain. And so there's, there's sunshine and there's rain and there's growth. Uh, and that's just a picture of the blessing that God will give to those who do things his way. Again, we're not talking about a health and wealth prosperity gospel for us that everything is going to go smoothly. But there is the blessing of God on those that follow him. And I hope that you can see that in your life. Uh, again, I'm not saying it. I hope that you have no problems. We all have problems. But I hope that you can see God blessing you and helping you through the problems and giving you joy in the midst of the problems. Uh, for sake of time, let's go on. Look at number six in verse five. I want to look at David's contrast to this. David's bittersweet life. Uh, and this obviously comes at the end of David's life, the last words of David. But the second half of 2 Samuel has been dark for David, as we've seen. He has sinned, he's had trouble come into his home, he's had trouble from without, from within, he's been running for his life, wondering, am I going to make it? So verse 5 says this, Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. For this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. It's interesting. He's got a little bit of a sandwich thing going on where he's got a negative angle, but then a very positive angle and then a, a negative angle. The negative is temporary. David says, from what I see in my house, in my family, in my life right now, I look at that blessing that God promises and I yearn for it. I say, oh, I'd, I'd love to have that kind of blessing. And he says, my house is not is not like this with God right now. David can look at his family and uh, he's had tragedy come through his house uh, from one on down the other, so many of his children. There's not one of David's children that we could point to and say he was a faithful man of God all the way through his life. The closest one would be Solomon and Solomon walked away from God hard for many years. He worshipped idols, he built temples to hundreds of false gods. He, he was an idol worshiper. He came back to God at the end of his life. But there's no, none of David's children that we can say they were just blessed, faithful men all the way through. He had murderers in his family. He had those that committed rape, uh, incest in his family. He had people that tried to overthrow, you know, sedition. They tried to overthrow the government, his own father, their own fathers. Uh, but David says, even though I don't see this right now, I have been given a promise. By the way, the promise that David's talking about, uh, he says, I have an, an everlasting covenant. Remember the Davidic covenant that God gave David. None of that has happened yet in David's life. Everything that God said, I'm going to bless your son, and then there's going to be uh, salvation for people, and the, the Messiah is going to come. David hasn't seen any of that yet. But he believes it. He knows that it's coming, and, he know, and he's at the end of his life, and he perceives... I'm not going to see this before I die, but I still know it's going to happen. And I hope that that is a reminder to us about the covenant, the promises that God has made to us, that we may not see it right now, but do you and I fall away from God sometimes? Do we doubt? Do we quit on God spiritually? Because we haven't seen it yet. Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I want to talk about the, the personal aspect of this for David. Notice what David said. He said, although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. David doesn't just say, you know, God has made a, he's made a wonderful covenant with us as Israelites, with our, with our family. He says, he says, me, God has made me an everlasting covenant. And look what Paul says in Galatians 2 and verse 20. He says, I am crucified with Christ Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. How often do we think about Jesus doing that? When he, we, we often say this, Jesus died for everyone. Is that true? Yes. But who does everyone include? It includes you and me. And I hope that we have this relationship with Jesus, that we say, Jesus, not just thank you for dying for us, but thank you for dying for me. That there's, a, there's an old song, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. And that can sound, oh, who do you think you are? Jesus was dying for everyone. You think he was thinking about you specifically? Yeah, I do. 
because he's the God of the whole universe. He can do everything at the same time. And I do believe that every one of your names and your faces was in his mind, and he was, and he was thinking this thought. Remember what it says in Hebrews chapter 12. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. I believe that joy was you and me. He knew that you would believe in him, and he, he was thinking this thought. Everything I'm going through, it's worth it. Not because we are worth it, but because he decided that by loving us, you know, it was worth it to him. And, and ingest Christianity on a personal level. Jesus loved me. Jesus has made promises to me. You don't slip through the cracks with God. You're not just a faceless person in a crowd. He, he calls you by name. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every problem that you're going to have. He already knows what he's going to do to fix it. And, and allow that personal relationship with Jesus to encourage you, to give you joy, to make your heart sing. David did. He says, I look around right now in my life. Yeah, I'm king, but it has been a troubled reign. My family has fallen apart. He says, my, it's not so with my house. But God has made with me an everlasting covenant. And he was encouraged by that. Uh, and by the way, the, the covenant that God has made with us is everlasting. It will never end. And I hope that that can help you to hold on. I can go through this temporary thing. It's only, by the way, if something lasts for the rest of your life, how long is that going to be? A year? Five years? <laughs> 50 years maybe? If something lasts for 50 more years and then you die, now you start eternity, and that was just a blip on the timeline of eternity. Let's, uh, even though we can't grasp it really and fathom it, Let's try to think eternal thoughts. And whatever I go through, it's worth it because it's just a moment in light of all of eternity. And so David says, I love that I have this eternal covenant, this everlasting covenant. Uh, and, and then at the end of the verse, David says, although he make it not to grow. It's like he's gone out and he's planted or, or God has planted a seed in the ground. And David comes out every day and he's been watering it, and the sun's shining on it, and he looks, and there's nothing growing out of the ground. There's nothing there. And some people would be discouraged by that. Oh, there's, he hasn't made it to grow. There's nothing there. David says, I know that these things are going to happen, even though I haven't seen anything grow out of the ground yet, because I take my Savior's promises to the bank. And there may be things in your life, by the way, I do hope that we are able to see certain things, growth. Maybe you're, you're desiring to see certain things from your children. I'd love to see my children grow up and accomplish this. And, and I hope that your thoughts for your children are, are the spiritual aspect is the most important. I, I want to see my children walk with God and know God. And I want to see God bless me. In my, I'd love to see people come to salvation and see that growth in my life. But I don't see it yet. And what thought do you think when you don't see it yet? You think, you know what? It's, come on, we've been fooling ourselves. No, it's not going to happen. Come on, anyone ever seen God face to face? No, we've never. How do we even know it's true? I hope that you don't see nothing and get discouraged by that, but that it causes you to, uh, to yearn for the future and, uh, and to know that even if I don't see it while I'm alive, I know that God's promises will happen. I know that when I die, even though I've never seen heaven, I know I'm going to open my eyes in heaven the moment I close them in death. I'm going to be absent from the body, but present with the Lord. I hope that you know. I hope, I hope that you don't just think that could happen, but that you know for sure it will happen because God promised it, and that you take the promises of God as the surest thing in the whole universe. Look at Psalm 37 and verse five. Psalm 37, and we'll read verses five through seven. God wants us to wait on Him and trust him that he's going to bring things to pass. And Psalm 37, 5 says this, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself, because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Notice that what it says in the middle of verse 7. Don't worry. Don't fret yourself because of him who prospereth. That's present tense. When you look around right now at the present, you think this is, this is 
reality. This is the ultimate reality, what I see right now. There's wicked people prospering. The righteous are struggling, and I'm struggling. I just don't think it's... No, God says, wait, rest in him, and wait patiently. And just because of what you see right now, that's not the future. Don't be discouraged. Don't be anxious because of what you see right now. Maybe there's someone that you're praying for. Maybe it's an unbeliever. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's in your own life. I, oh, I keep struggling with this. I'd love to get over this hump and have victory. Maybe you haven't seen it yet. But rest in the Lord and wait patiently, and God will do these things. Here's a wonderful verse that speaks to every believer. Look at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. I hope that this is an encouraging verse for us. Philippians 1 verse 6. It says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God will never give up on you. God will never just say, okay, done. I'm just going to cast this person into hell. And once God starts something in someone, once someone is saved, God's going to bring that person all the way to heaven. God will continue to work. Now, we may not always cooperate with his working, right? We may not always walk with him, but God will continue to perform what he started all the way. So whatever promise God has made, you may not, it may be in the ground still, you may not see it growing, but it's going to, God's going to continue to, to build that and grow it. He will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so David's encouraged, even though he doesn't see it right now, he says, I know he's got this personal relationship with God and those covenants. And let's finish with this number seven, back in uh, verse six of Second Samuel 23. David uh, points to the judgment on wickedness. Verse 6 says, But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and the staff of a spear, and they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. And so he's kind of, again, waxing eloquent, uh, poetic, about the wickedness. He's just said God will bless those that are righteous. God will bless them. There's going to be like the sun and the rain and growth. But the wicked, God has judgment. The sons of Belial and all of them, uh, they'll be as thorns thrust away. And here we have some future tense. They shall be, all of them, as thorns thrust away. So there, it's a sure thing that there will be judgment coming on wickedness. We need to do... A, by the way, we can do it with both sides of things. We can look right now, push pause on everything right now. And you can see things that are good. By the way, the, the world says that good is evil and evil good, right? We've all seen that in certain ways. We can see things that are good, that are just struggling. They're not, it doesn't seem like they're being blessed. God says, just wait, it's, it's gonna be blessed. We could see the prosperity of the wicked. This person hates God. They, they say there is no God and yet they're growing and by the way I just saw this is not really related but I just saw an article this week that was talking about Harvard University by the way you know Harvard was named after a pastor um, and it was started as a seminary it started as a place that worshiped God and now they barely let God in now God's name the Bible verses are still on the buildings that were built you know 400 years ago uh, and but just this week they've elevated to the head of all their chaplains on campus in their school of religion an atheist. Uh, and you think, well, how did he get in there? Someone must have pulled a string. No, he was unanimously selected and elected by all of the other chaplains. They looked at this person that doesn't even believe there is a God and says, we don't look to God or the Bible. We look to ourselves to fix our problems. And they say, we want you to be the head over all of us in our spiritual life. And you look at that and say, how, how does this happen? How can atheism thrive like it is today? How can people that are godless, how can they be rising to the top? Well, it's just right now. But remember what Asaph said in Psalm 73, until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I saw their end. They're going to be cast down. And so we need to know that judgment is coming for wickedness. Um, look at Psalm 50 and verse 20. And then we're going to turn to Ecclesiastes 8. Psalm 50, 5, 0, verse 20. Sometimes people do wickedness and it seems like they get away with it and people say, where, where is God? Where was God? This person, they lived their whole life like this, and then they died. Nobody, they never got caught. They got away with it. Look what Psalm 50 and verse 20 says. 
It says, thou sittest, and it gives several things that people are doing wrongly and wickedly. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thine own mother's son. And then verse 21. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. God speaking. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. Sometimes we can see it's like nothing happens. God is keeping silence right now. And by the way, God doesn't always judge sin immediately right away. God sometimes waits. And the Bible does say that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Sometimes the reason God doesn't judge right away is that God says, I'm going to give you an act of mercy. I'm going to see how you're going to respond to that. Are you going to take my mercy and say, God, I, thank you for sparing me. I'm not going to do that again. Or are you going to say, oh, I did it and I got away with it. I guess I'm, I'm going to keep going. Sometimes God waits to see how we respond. And so he says, I, I kept silence. And you thought that I was okay with it because I didn't do anything. And, and then it says this, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. We just need to have patience. We live in an instant society. Everything has to happen fast. Um, we have to have instant oatmeal and instant coffee. You know, if you drink coffee, you should have to wait forever to get it. But, anyway, um, but it, you know, you watch a, a sitcom, 30-minute sitcom. Any problem that comes up, solved by the end of 30 minutes, it's all done, we're on to the next thing. And we expect that type of thing. If somebody does wrong, he needs to get, uh, there's two things we need, by the way. He needs to get what he deserves fast, and I need to see it. That's the justice that we want. I need to be able to gloat over this person and say, I told you so. We don't always get that. We need to wait on the Lord, and it may happen after our death. It may happen after his death. Remember the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was abusive his whole life, and then they died, and then it was flipped. He says, remember in your lifetime you had good things and Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. They had to wait till after their deaths, both of their deaths, to see what was the ultimate reality. So we may not always see it in our lifetime. Just because God's not doing something yet, don't quit on God. Just because you're not seeing that growth in your life, don't quit on God. Uh, look at Ecclesiastes, two more verses, and then we'll be done. Ecle and we're done in 2 Samuel. Uh, Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 12, and then we'll finish with 1 John chapter 2. Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 12. This is a, a principle we need to just embed in our spirit. It says, though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged. We've all seen that, right? We've seen wicked people. They, he did that a hundred times and nothing happened. It says, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. It goes on to say, but it shall not be well. It will be evil with those that are wicked. Just because we don't see it now doesn't mean that righteousness is not coming, that justice is not coming. So here's what we need to do. David, in his last words, reminds us of this. We live in an upside-down world where truth has fallen in the street, people don't care, but it seems like they're getting away with it. As we look at the present reality, I don't know if reality is the right word, but what we perceive as reality, as we look at the present, don't quit on God and think, you know what, I'm just going to start doing what they're doing. I mean, I know it's wicked and it's illegal, but they're getting away with it. I could, I could get away with it too. Don't jump ship. Don't flip sides. And don't be weary in well-doing because justice and righteousness are going to come. God will reward your righteousness. Let's finish with this. Look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. Just a, a closing thought, a, a, an admonition to us to stay with God. It says, And now, little children... Abide in him. That, by the way, that has nothing to do with salvation. God never commands an unbeliever to abide in Jesus. That's impossible. But for believers, God commands us to abide in him. And it says that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Don't be deceived by what the, you know, the devil wants to show you certain things. But by the way, the devil hides a lot behind a curtain. He doesn't want to let you pull the curtain back and see what's on the other side. But one day, for all of eternity, and again, there's a moment of this lifetime. Say, no, it's not a moment. It's 50 years. Fine, it's 50 years. But it's just a blip on eternity. But for all of eternity, God will bless 
your righteousness for all of eternity, people will regret wickedness and, and sin that they've done. So stay with God. Don't, don't flip over to the other side because you're discouraged by what you see right now. David says, I don't see it right now. My house is not so with God, and God has not yet made it to grow. But I know that his eternal covenant is sure, and I'm going to walk with him. And may we walk with Jesus for the rest of our lives. Let's close together in prayer. Lord, we thank you for David. We know that David was not a perfect man. And even as we look at King David, may it cause us to yearn for the true king of Israel that will come one day, the perfect, righteous, just king. I pray that you would be the king of our lives even now, that your kingdom is within us and that we want to walk with you in righteousness and holiness. And we know that in the world right now, it doesn't seem like that's always blessed, but we know from all the truths in your word that righteousness is blessed by you and wickedness is judged by you. Help us to internalize that. Help us to share that with the world around us, especially help us to share with the world around us that the ultimate justice is coming, that all sinners will be cast into hell. And help us to share the message of salvation with urgency. Help us to be righteous. We're reminded that he that ruleth among men must be just. It's not a bad thing to be educated and to have savvy but help us to strive. The number one character quality of our lives is that we fear you. We're just and we walk before you. And we know that you'll take care of all the rest. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching today. If you have made a decision to follow God in some way or would like prayer, let us know at flbc at cox.net. We would love to connect with you, pray for you, or send you some resources that can help you in your walk with God. If you would like to know more about how to go to heaven, visit us at folbaptist.com slash heaven. If you would like to give financially to support our ministry, you can do so at folbaptist.com slash give. Thank you and God bless you.